This lecture is part of an online um, course on complex analysis and will be about the maximum modulus principle. So um, this says that if um, f attains its maximum value um, at z in u, so u is going to be some open set and f is going to be a holomorphic function of course and maximal means that f of z is greater than or equal to f of w for w in u. Um, so if all these conditions are satisfied then f is constant. So again this is one of these results that if you're used to real variables is a little bit surprising because of course if we've got a um, a nice function on the real line, it's very easy to, for it to have a maximum inside in the interior of some open set. But for complex variables, it says this can't actually happen. Um, and the proof of this is quite easy. So suppose we've got some open set u and suppose we've got some point um, where f is maximum. Let's make this point zero for simplicity. So suppose f of zero is maximal. What we do is we pick a little curve c around zero and we apply Cauchy's um, integral formula. So f of zero is one over two pi i times the integral over c of f of z over z dz. So this is yet another application of Cauchy's integral formula. Um, and we calculate this. It's one over two pi i times the integral from zero to two pi of f of r e to the i theta over r e to the i theta times i r e to the i theta d theta where of course we've just put r equals um, sorry z equals r e to the i theta and this is just 1 over 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f of r e to the i theta d theta and now this just says that f of 0 is the average of f on this circle C. So that, 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 this, is, this is actually almost another form of the maximum modulus principle. It says that functions are the averages of, of what they are nearby in some sense. Um, so um, now, now we'll deduce the maximum modulus principle for this. So suppose that f of naught, f of zero has value m. This means that f of z is less than or equal to m because we assumed that f of zero was, was maximal. And what you do is you think about the circle of radius m and somewhere on it is this point f of zero. And um, then we have the image of the circle c. So, so, so the, these are the points of the form f of um, r e to the i theta. And now we see that f of zero is just the average of the values um, on c for a suitable weight on the circle or whatever. And we see that f of zero can't possibly be the average of these values on c because some of them are on that side of, 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 of the circle unless um, um, f of z is equal to f of zero for all z on the circle c. So this implies f is constant. Um, I mean it's, it's going to be constant on some small circle around that and then we can just apply analytic continuation. So that's the proof of the maximum modulus principle. The only functions that can attain their maximum values are constants. Um, um, th 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 there's a, um, a physical interpretation of this. Um, you recall the real value of a holomorphic function is harmonic. This means it satisfies the steady state heat equation. Um, in other words, it can be the steady state value for heat on some sort of open metal plate in, of, the, of the shape U. Well, um, the heat in steady state must satisfy the maximum modulus principle because if, if, we, if we had a sort of maximal um, heat here, 
well you know what would happen the heat would just flow out to points where the temperature was lower because that's what heat does so um, um, so the physical meaning of the maximum modulus principle just says that that that, that if you've got steady state heat in some metal plate the heat can't be um, maximal anywhere unless unless the unless the temperature is constant anywhere everywhere um, and we know that for a, a, a function the real part of the logarithm of f is equal to the logarithm of the absolute value of f and since the real part of f can't attain a maximum value the log of the absolute value of f can't attain the maximum value either and therefore the absolute value of f can't attain a maximum value you notice by the way the only minimum value that um, f can actually attain is zero. Um, if f is zero then its logarithm is no longer holomorphic so um, this argument no longer applies. So, so harmonic function, so holomorphic functions can never attain their maximum value unless they're constant and they can only attain their minimum value if they're either constant or, or have a zero somewhere. Um, well now we have some applications of this. The first is the fundamental theorem of algebra. This says that any polynomial that's not constant has a root. So let's call this polynomial f. Suppose f has no root and is not constant. Um, what we do is we, is we kind of look at the value of f of 0, so we might have f of 0 equals m, and then we know f of z tends to z, um, um, so 1 over f of z tends to 0 as the absolute value of z tends to infinity because if f of z is equal to a n z to the n plus a n minus 1 z to the n minus 1 that, and so on then um, for large z it's going to be dominated by this term. So um, 1 over f c tends to 0 and 1 over f c is also um, holomorphic because f has no zeros. Um, so what we can do is we can find a big circle such that say f of z is at most say m over 2 and um, outside this circle um, and then we just pick the maximum value of f on this compact disk so so suppose it's here so so we can pick pick the maximum value of the absolute value of f because we've got a compact region and any continuous function of a compact region takes an absolute takes a maximal value somewhere so f must have a maximal value somewhere here and it can't be constant because it tends to zero outside there so so this is this contradicts the maximum modulus theorem so we get a contradiction and the only way out of this is if f is not holomorphic which means that f so if 1 over f is not holomorphic which means that f must vanish somewhere um, by the way there's an alternative way of proving this that people sometimes use which uses Liouville theor Liouville's theorem um, which says that any bounded function, any bounded holomorphic function must be constant and you see that here we've got um, the, the inverse of the polynomial is bounded and holomorphic therefore it must be constant. But of course the proofs of Liouville's theorem and the maximum modulus theorem are actually pretty closely related. Um, so um, the next ex application is um, what are all the symmetries of the unit disk. So here u is going to be the set of z such that z has absolute value less than 1. So it just looks like this. Well what do we mean by symmetry of the unit disk? Well one obvious symmetry is z maps to e to the i theta times z. We can just rotate it and that's obviously a symmetry by any reasonable definition of a symmetry. Um, well more generally a symmetry is going to be a map f from u to u which is holomorphic and has an inverse um, f to the minus 1 which also takes u to u. So you can think of u as being a sort of holomorphic map 
that's a bijection from the unit disk to itself. And um, obviously the composition and inverse of any two of these maps is going to be in this map. So we actually get a group. And what we want to do is to figure out what this group is. And it's not immediately obvious it has any elements at all other than these rotations. But then you notice we can put f of z equals z minus a over 1 minus a bar z. And you can check that if z equals 1, then z mi mi minus a is equal to 1 minus a bar z quite easily. So f of z is also equal to 1. So f maps the unit circle to itself. And if a has absolute value less than 1, um, f maps the unit circle um, to itself. And you can check that its inverse is also a map of this form. So, so this is the symmetry of the unit circle. So we get a three-dimensional group of symmetries which um, map f of z to e to the i theta times z minus a over 1 minus a bar z for a having absolute value less than 1. And this is three-dimensional because we've got one dimensional way of choosing theta because it's real, but a is a complex number so that gives us a sort of two-dimensional space of possible numbers a. So we found three-dimensional space of these things. These are called Moebius transformations, by the way. Uh, it's the same guy who invented the Moebius band, in case you were wondering. Um, so the problem we've got to find is, are there any others? So suppose um, f maps u to u, um, and for the moment we won't assume it has an inverse. Um, well, we can uh, um, compose with a suitable Moebius transformation to make um, f0 equals 0. Because um, for any point in the unit circle, we can find a Mobius transformation taking that point to 0. So we may as well just compose f with it and we, we get a function such that f0 equals 0. And what we want to do now is to show that f is to examine the possibilities for f. And what we do is we put gz equals f of z over z. And um, gz is holomorphic because this has a removable singularity at 0 because f of 0 vanishes. And now we want to show that if z is less than 1, then g of z is less than or equal to 1. And with equality, only if g is constant. And for this, what we do is we look at the unit circle. And we look at a, a circle of radius r inside that. Um, and um, on this circle here, g of z is um, less than or equal to f of z over r, which is less than or equal to 1 over r. So g of z is at most 1 over r inside this circle of radius r. Now if we take r tending to 1, we can see 1 over r tends to 1. So we can see that g of z must actually be less than or equal to 1 because it's less than or equal to anything bigger than 1. Um, And um, so um, now we see that g of 0 obviously has absolute value less than or equal to 1. And if g of 0 equals 1, then g is constant by the maximum modulus principle. Um, um, so um, uh, if um, now, now, now suppose f has an inverse f to the minus 1 mapping u to u. And again, f to the minus 1, 0 is equal to 0. Um, well, we know that um, f of 0, the, the, the derivative of f of 0 is going to be 1 over the um, uh, derivative of um, the inverse of f. And this is 
less than or equal to one in absolute value. And this is less than or equal to, and, and this thing down here is less than or equal to one in absolute value. So this must be greater than or equal to one. So we see that F zero prime must actually have absolute value equal to one. And F zero prime is just G of zero. Um, and if G of zero has absolute value one, this implies G is constant. So F is linear. So um, this implies that F of um, zeta must be e to the i theta times z for some theta. So um, this completes the proof that all symmetries of the unit disk must be one of this three-dimensional space of maps that we um, described earlier. Um, well, the, the, the maps of the form um, z goes to e to the i theta times z minus a over 1 minus a bar z. Um, these form a group, but it's a little bit tricky to see what the structure of this group actually is. Um, well, we can identify it by noting that the unit circle, or the unit disk, is in some sense equivalent to the upper half plane H. And there are holomorphic maps from U to H and H to U that, have in, that are inverses of each other. For instance, if W is in U, then we can um, write this as Z minus I over Z plus I for Z in H. So W is going to be in U. And conversely, Z corresponds to point I times 1 plus W over 1 minus W. So it's an easy exercise to check that, that, the, that these are holomorphic and identify the unit disk with the upper half plane. And since the unit disk is identified with the upper half plane, any symmetry of the unit disk can be translated, can be transformed into a symmetry of the upper half plane. So we get a three-dimensional group of symmetries at the upper half plane. And these are much easier to describe. The, the, the symmetries are the group PSL2 of R. This means two by two matrices A, B, C, D. Um, with AD minus BC equals 1. That's the determinant. And P means you divide by the group of, with two elements where, where the diagonal entries are 1. And this acts on the upper half plane by ABCD acting on tau is equal to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. So by transferring our results from the unit disk to the upper half plane, we can easily check that this is um, the group of all symmetries um, of the upper half plane. Um, so uh, this um, occur this is used an awful lot in the in the theory of modular forms and functions, which I will just very briefly explain. So the idea is find a, 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 a group gamma contained in um, PSL2 of Z and look for functions on H invariant under gamma. And these functions are called modular functions and turn out to be very complicated and very interesting. So a typical example you might take gamma to be PSL2 of Z, um, which all matrices A, B, C, D with A, B, C, and D in the integers. Um, so, so the maximum modulus principle sort of tells us that um, PSL2 of R is in fact the, 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 the largest possible group of symmetries of the upper half plane. So it's the correct group to use um, when we're studying functions um, invariant under groups on the upper half plane. Okay, that's all for the maximum modulus principle for the moment.